And our last event is getting underway with your moderator not quite having his act together on the mute button. My apologies. I'm Patrick Eddington of the Cato Institute, a senior fellow here. Uh, our, con our, our event today is uh, dealing with a critical issue that has been dominating uh, headlines here in the United States for some time. That is the China Initiative. Uh, the origins and the consequences of that particular Department of Justice program will be the focus of our discussion today. Uh, just some admin notes very quickly here at the outset. For those of you who are joining us online, uh, you can submit your questions through our website, through YouTube, Facebook, Twitter. Uh, please get those questions rolling in because I do intend to basically interject those throughout the course of the event. We want to make sure uh, that we get to as many of your questions as possible. And we have a great panel here today uh, to help us kind of go through all these different uh, issues and aspects of this slice of the U.S.-China relationship. I do want to take just a couple of minutes uh, to kind of set the scene here a little bit for those of you who may not be as familiar with this issue as, as perhaps some others are. Um, when we get to February of 2022, it will literally mark 50 years since then-President Richard Nixon's historic trip to the People's Republic of China, which was the initial step on the pathway to the normalization of relations uh, between our two countries two countries that had been uh, very much at each other's throat, quite literally on the battlefield on the Korean Peninsula during the Korean War. Now, since the normalization of relations uh, between the United States and China in 1979, the amount of trade and travel between the two countries has increased by orders of magnitude, and the number of U.S.-China collaborations uh, in the areas of clean energy research, space operations and exploration and other areas has also grown very dramatically. But by the middle of President Obama's uh, second term, really at the latest, tensions between the United States and China had risen very sharply. The key factors that were driving that from the U.S. perspective uh, were unfair trade practices and discriminatory trade practices, as well as investment practices by the PRC, and U.S. government claims, which uh, your moderator believes are pretty well founded, uh, a PRC uh, intelligence service culpability in several high-profile hacking incidents targeting U.S. entities. This conflict escalated to an entirely new level in November 2018 when the Trump administration's Justice Department 
announced the launch of the China Initiative, an investigative and prosecution program ostensibly aimed at blunting alleged or actual PRC or PRC-affiliated intellectual property theft and technology theft, uh, and uh, also alleging essentially the use of uh, so-called non-traditional collectors by the People's Republic of China intelligence services, in this case, allegedly university researchers and scientists, students, uh, and so on, for tech transfers deemed by DOJ uh, to be contrary to the U.S. national interest. Just this week, the trial of former Harvard University Chemistry Department Chair Dr. David Lieber got underway in Boston. Lieber, a leading researcher in the field of nanotechnology, has been accused by DOJ officials of lying about his involvement in the uh, PRC's Thousand Talents program, and we'll get into some more detail about that shortly, on his federal grant applications. Among those academics and researchers targeted under the China Initiative, Lieber is white making him a racial outlier in a DOJ program that has, as we'll hear today from some of our panelists, seemingly overwhelmingly focused on Chinese or Chinese American researchers. So how big is this IP theft and tech theft problem on the part of, of the Chinese government? How aggressive is the PRC in, in pursuing traditional espionage operations against the United States, both personnel and, and entities? What other countries have foreign talent recruitment programs besides China? Has the DOJ China Initiative become a racial and ethnic profiling program, as many have alleged? And what are the implications of these disputes for the future of U.S.-China cooperation on economic and other issues? Uh, I'm very much hoping that our panel uh, will be able to help us sort those out. Joining us today is Dr. Derek Scissors, a senior fellow at the American Enterprise Institute and a longtime China watcher and expert. My former uh, House of Representatives staff colleague uh, and currently assistant professor of law, at the Antonin Scalia Law School at George Mason University, Jamil Jaffer. Dr. Jeremy Wu, uh, the founder of APA Justice uh, and a longtime uh, government executive himself. And finally, uh, Gisela Kusakawa, a staff attorney at Asian Americans Advancing Justice. Um, I want to note at the outset that Cato did invite representatives of the Department of Justice to participate in this forum, but the department never responded to Cato's inv uh, invitation. I want to start uh, with you, Derek Scissors, and I think it's important for us to all really kind of keep in mind just exactly how big this U.S.-China relationship is. Give us, give us some numbers in, in terms of the amount of trade, investment, uh, those kinds of things uh, in the relationship. Well, obviously, these numbers are you know, affected by the pandemic, but um, you know, the, let, let's take an investment number because I think this is the, the prime uh, mover in U.S.-China relations for the, the past few years. While we're supposedly having a trade war, and, and I would, I'd say that in the trade war, um, the bilateral deficit that the U.S. runs with China, which I don't think is very important, but some people do, has risen from 2019. So we had a trade war, we imposed tariffs, and the bilateral deficit is rising. And in fact, uh, U.S.-China trade volume will be the second or third highest on record this year, um, bouncing back very strongly from, from pandemic impact in 2020. But the, the, the prime mover really for the past five years has been U.S. investment into China. Um, since 2016, this has more than tripled. Uh, I would say conservatively, we're looking at $600 billion of new investment uh, by the United States into China. It's something that doesn't get paid much attention to because the Department of the Treasury chooses to record most of it as investment in the Cayman Islands. Uh, we don't have to get into why that's ridiculous. The Cayman Islands does not have securities markets. Um, but uh, as an illustration, we've had a long, very large investment, a trade relationship with China at various times. You know, uh, we, you know China is the biggest source of our imports. They're a, they're a major source of exports. We've now supplemented that with a very large U.S. Uh, investment relationship where American money is heading to China. And we could talk about people, the people movement and technology exchanges and all of those things as well. But I think, um, you know, when you when you talk about hundreds of billions of dollars of U.S. money heading to China, when we're supposedly in a period of high tension, you can see the size of the relationship. We're talking about two countries that have, in, in many respects, you know, very, very different systems. And, and what I find um, interesting, and I think many, many people find very concerning, is the nature, essentially, of the China system. Um, you know, one of your colleagues in this field, Mark Wu of, of Harvard, has, has coined this term, China Inc., um, give us a sense, essentially, of the kinds of obstacles or things that American companies have to do 
in order to actually be able to get into the Chinese market? So, I mean, let's start with the positives, right? It, it's a large market. It has untapped potential in a number of areas. Sometimes the party, Communist Party, doesn't want that potential to, potential to be tapped. Um, rural wealth in China is deliberately suppressed by, by party law um, and, and doctrine. Uh, but, but there are a lot of opportunities uh, that, that have not been fully realized yet. Um, so that's, that's the initial draw here. Now, when you, when you come to China and you say, wow, I really want to be here, to, you know, there's, there's a lot of upside, the parties, you know, and the government say, well, you know, if there's a lot of upside, you know, what are you bringing for us? And if you're, if you're bringing um, really good products, that's great. But then, you know, we might learn how to make your really good products and, and then we don't need you anymore. And that has happened to a number of foreign manufacturers. The latest, uh, not latest as is, it's, it's recent, but it's been going on for a while, is that um, there's coercive tech transfer in violation of WTO principles, although a lot of WTO principles are violated by a lot of countries. But uh, there's no reasonable argument to say that foreign companies aren't told if you want to fully exploit the large, valuable Chinese market, you need to share technology. And the Chinese don't even really do a good job of pretending to deny it. They say the foreign companies choose to do that because they want to have good terms in China. I'm like, well, you know, you know what would be even better is if they got to serve the Chinese market without transferring technology, but it, none of them seem to choose to do that. So I think the, the major issue here in terms of foreign company treatment is that you're, you're required to, to transfer technology. There's another background issue here, which everyone has accepted, which is you cannot compete with state-owned enterprises. Uh, people talk about subsidies to state-owned enterprises, whether being loans and such, but the, but the biggest subsidy is regulatory protection from competition. State-owned enterprises do not fail for commercial reasons. So if you come into a sector where state-owned enterprises is operating, you can't outcompete them, drive them out of business and grab market share for yourself. But that's always been true. And I, I think companies are tolerant of that as long as there is growth potential in China. What they really dislike is being, is being coerced on the tech side. And by tech, I do not necessarily mean advanced technology. I mean the innovations that make your company's products better. And when, when you use the phrase coercive um, uh, IP transfer, essentially, can can you give us some examples, um, you know, for, from the past here that that directly involve U.S. companies or or even you know Western companies? Well, I can give you some dramatic examples. There are a lot of very subtle examples that occur on a daily basis, but you know, possibly the most dramatic is that um, China in the 1990s was a, a very backward but very promising telecom market, as we've seen. Right now, Chinese telecom firms are among the world's largest and most competitive. Well, in the 90s, they were far behind, but you know, 1.2 billion phones and, and, and those kinds of slogans. So Motorola, which at that point was an American company and a large one uh, that those of us of the correct age remember well, uh, was told you can serve this enormous telecom market, but you need to set up a research facility of, of, of some size and you need to cooperate with, with, um, with your Chinese partners in that research. And they did. Um, and the technology diffused. It was not the only source of technological diffusion in the Chinese telecom industry, but it was one of them. Um, and the end result is Motorola did not gain the, the, the results in China it was looking for because it outcompeted in China. Then it was outcompeted around the world. Then it failed. Then its remnants were bought by a Chinese company. So, you know, in a very dramatic story, and I don't mean to say they're all that dramatic, you had a, a, an extremely lucrative market, Chinese telecom. It looked lucrative. It turned out to be lucrative. Motorola couldn't resist. End result, Motorola transfers technology and dies. You get really concerned about the issue of, of IP and, and tech theft. You know, out, outside of this, this uh, on Chinese soil activity that you've literally just described in great detail, the, the other aspect of this is alleged or actual IP theft that takes place in a, in a different context. When did you get concerned about that? And, and give us some examples of that if you can. Yeah, I, I've been concerned about it for a long time. Um, to me, the, the biggest economic barrier uh, to, to US-China relations raised by the Chinese side and really the biggest barrier in the relationship on the economic side is the subsidies I referred to before, regulatory protection for state-owned enterprises, non-commercial lending and so on. But the biggest problem that extends across economic security politics is IP theft. Um, it takes away American comparative advantage so that when you are as a, as a free trade person trying to talk about comparative advantage, 
if it's being undermined uh, by your partner stealing your IP, which is a key part of American comparative advantage, the trade relationship doesn't make sense anymore. So it's been a fundamental problem for a long time. Now, 25 years ago, the IP that China was stealing may have been important to certain American companies. I'm not denying that. It wasn't strategically important. It wasn't something to challenge our core industries. It wasn't something to arm the Chinese military with advanced technology. It wasn't used uh, for, to spread surveillance uh, technology all over the world, not limited to China. As China has naturally and successfully progressed, that IP theft becomes more important. It's unavoidable. Um, you know, when you're stealing watches and you're, you're ripping off brands of watches on the street, that's an irritant for the watchmakers. When you're trying to steal uh, Micron technology, that's an irritant for large parts of the United States and the U.S. government. Um, so, you know, what happens, he, I, I'd rather not, uh, I single out Motorola because, um, you know, they, they have nothing to lose at this point to be, to, to be angry at me or anyone else on the panel. I'd rather not mention cases. I will say that, you know, I've documented for the U.S. government three dozen cases, uh, some of which are public record, most of which probably are public record in some way, of, of IP theft. It's hard to get cooperation from the companies. They don't like disclosing that they've lost their IP. Um, and I, I'm sure the U.S. government has documentation of more. Sometimes we look at the public record and it doesn't seem that way, but I certainly hope so. So there are dozens of cases of, of, of corporate loss, uh, dozens of cases of widespread hacking. I, I'll mention one in particular. Several months after a supposed agreement with the Obama administration to stop hacking or reduce it in some way, Chinese began the cloud hopping campaign where they use cloud hopping to cloud computing to jump into the servers of a number of companies. Um, another famous example in telecom involves Nortel, which is a Canadian telecom company whose network got compromised by the Chinese and it is now dead, um, continuing with theme. So there are dozens of these examples uh, of corporate theft where even if you don't go to China, your, your IP, your, your data is um, in danger. I would say, you know, just to, to be humble about this, I thought this problem would fade with Chinese innovation. It has not, partly because cyber makes theft easier. It's a lot easier to grab lots of information through cyber means, but now partly because we have a, a, a new Chinese uh, mercantilist goal, which is data control, which is acquire as much data from overseas as possible while retaining data within China. And that is going to spur Chinese uh, uh, IP theft, in this case, involving data accumulated by companies that, the China, that China finds valuable. And, and the, this entire issue of the actual cost, the economic cost uh, of the kind of, of, of theft and activity that you're talking about, I've seen some really wild variations in the figures from like a low of, I think, 225 billion, maybe going north of 600 billion. What what is the issue in terms of of getting a, a relatively accurate figure? Is is part of it going back to what you just discussed with respect to companies being reluctant to talk about it? Uh, are there other factors that make it difficult to to get our hands on on a, on a decent number? Yeah, I, I think you pointed at this. Um, what you have with companies is, well, we don't want to go public with this IP disclosure loss, and you know you can't use it in public, and you can't talk about it in the hearing, and we don't talk, talk to members of Congress or members of the administration. But it was enormous, and you know you, when you're not willing to put it under public spotlight, it's very difficult to evaluate your claims about how valuable it is. And in general, you know it, IP is hard. Um, let's say I have some IP and somebody steals it. One possibility is that I would be able to protect my IP otherwise for a long period of time, and I would have gotten an enormous gain out of it. But the possibility is somebody else is close to developing it anyway. I would have had a nice first mover advantage, made some money, and then it would have it would have been in the you know public realm. So uh, yes, you definitely have disclosure problems. Um, but even with disclosure, even if we knew all the cases of IP loss, we would have a big measurement challenge ahead of us. You know, the company's version of what the IP was worth versus the market's version can diverge quite uh, widely. You know, I, I would say, I would even say 225 billion on a regular basis is a little high. I think it's in the many tens of billions. And the problem is it, is it occurs annually. annually. It wasn't in the past. It's not like, oh, we lost a lot of money back then and it stopped. It has not stopped. It is a continuing problem where, where US firms are losing, I would say high tens of billions. We can even say a hundred billion dollars. That is a very rough figure that varies from year to year, but it gives you a sense of the magnitude. It's not 100 billion one year; it's 100 billion every year. And to kind of bring this from the macro down to maybe not quite the total micro, but but to a, a more direct and human level, 
at the end of the day, I, IP ultimately is originated by people. Um, do you have concerns um, on on the number and the kind of, of, of Chinese scientists and students and researchers that are coming to this country in, in terms of this overall IP theft problem that you have discussed? Do you, do you see an issue there? I do. Um, I used to teach at GW. I taught a Chinese econ course. Um, and at, by the end of it, by the end of my time teaching, most of my students were mainland Chinese. And none of those people, they could have all my notes. They could have everything I did. There's no IP problem there. So there, there are, I don't know what the percentages are, but I would, I would guess the large majority uh, of Chinese uh, students and faculty and, 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 and other participants in the U.S. academic system, they're, they're not studying anything we should be concerned about. I mean, it, it's a benefit to us. It's a benefit to them, and they should be left alone. Um, but it would be extremely naive to look at China's government under Xi Jinping, and, and I would say some very nasty things about Xi Jinping and the way he governs, if, if it were rel directly relevant to this discussion. But the Chinese government interferes um, you know, in, from, from labor practices to the TV anchor is acting too effeminate. I mean, that literally is a, is, a, is a point of interference. It would be very naive for American academics to think that their counterpart, whatever their original motivation, um, you know, is, un, is untouched by Chinese intelligence. That's not the way this works, uh, unfortunately. When something is considered to be valuable uh, by the Chinese state, they reach out and they get everyone. That includes Jack Ma, uh, it includes, uh, you know, a, a, an ordinary grad student who's ventured into a U.S. lab. So there is definitely a risk here. Uh, it's an evolving risk. It doesn't stay static. It's not exactly the same now as it was 10 years ago, and it will not be the same 10 years from now. But you're looking at a, a, a totalitarian dictatorship. Um, I, you know, it's been studying, as you mentioned, China for 30 years. This is a much worse government, in my opinion, than its three predecessors uh, going all the way back, or I guess you could say four, going all the way back to Mao. It's really naive to think that everybody coming here is doing so in the spirit of academic cooperation. Most are, but some aren't. Excellent segue for me to turn uh, to my friend, Jamil Jaffer. I'm going to assume, uh, Jamil, that you pretty much agree with everything that Derek just said. Yeah, I mean, I share a lot of the, a lot of the same concerns that Derek just raised, absolutely. Um, you know, you have been uh, in the intelligence business um, in one fashion or another for a very long time. You served in the Bush White House, uh, in the Bush administration. You served uh, on Capitol Hill in the House and the Senate. And you've had your own experience, essentially, dealing with PRC-related issues. I know that, that when you and I overlapped on the Hill, uh, you know, Huawei was, you know, almost item number one, essentially, uh, on, the, on the committee's agenda in a lot of respects. Um, give us a sense, if you, if you can and you will, about why we should be concerned about Chinese companies like Huawei and ZTE. Yeah. Well, you know, Pat, I think one of the biggest challenges we face with uh, telecommunications companies like Huawei and ZTE um, is the sort of huge, uh, you know, consumer base and, 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 and corporate user base that they have. Uh, Huawei doesn't just make, uh, you know, commercial handheld devices. They make huge telecommunications routers uh, that route tremendous amounts of traffic. And, and you know, our allies, uh, British Telecom at one point, put some of these routers at the core of its networks. A uh, number of other nations have done so in part because uh, Huawei equipment is cheaper. Uh, the government subsidizes it. Uh, a lot of early on our Huawei equipment was uh, essentially uh, American intellectual property uh, theft that was then repurposed for private use um, in China. And again, remember, uh, as Derek pointed out, what is public and private in China um, isn't the same as when we think about the difference between public and private. Um, there is that civil, military, uh, and government fusion uh, in that system. And so, you know, when they steal intellectual property from American companies or the government, and hand it over to a private sector company. That doesn't that doesn't seem odd uh, in their context. In our context, obviously, it's hugely problematic. And then you have these companies like Huawei, not only uh, basing their technology on stolen intellectual property, saving uh, billions of dollars in R and D efforts, uh, and then improving upon it, um, and then going further, uh, benefiting from government subsidies and government loans uh, to sell things at well below cost. That then allows them to get into these markets, into these other nations, into core telecommunications infrastructure, by the way, in the United States, too, um, in localities and states 
Um, uh, we have a huge problem of Huawei and ZTE infrastructure. And, and then the question becomes, okay, well, so what? Who cares if they own these routers or these devices? Uh, why should we care? And the answer is, well, um, you know, there's a quid pro quo for these low interest loans and, and these subsidies and these benefits um, and the IP, it's, it's, you know, hand over our data to the Chinese government. And so when, uh, when uh, you have telecommunications systems that are essentially co-opted uh, by an entity that works closely with the government that has uh, members of the government on their, on their executive committee, on their board, um, in positions of senior leadership, uh, the willingness and desire to transfer information when asked or to uh, provide access for surveillance is significantly larger than in other cases. And so um, all of these elements are things that gave the House Intelligence Committee, uh, when they studied this question, a pause uh, in the in the 20, uh, 2012, 2013, 2014 timeframe. It's why they first, for the first time ever, publicly released a report uh, describing these concerns with Huawei and ZTE in particular. Um, but these problems have not gotten better. Uh, at some level, they've gotten worse. There is an increasing understanding and acknowledgement amongst uh, uh, American allies. Australia has been a leader in this space uh, to call out Huawei and ZTE um, and to make efforts to, to remove them or to ensure they're not in their infrastructure. Uh, but it took a while, frankly, for the United States and Australia together to convince the British and British Telecom uh, to start pulling this stuff out. We've now been successful and they're working that effort. Uh, but even here in the United States, these localities and, and, and state uh, agencies um, have challenges. It's, it's not going to be cheap to pull this equipment out. We're going to have to help them with that. Uh, but these are very real threats, um, and, and we've got to take account of them now um, and ensure that not only uh, American instrumentalities are allies, but also uh, third-party nations that aren't necessarily in one camp or the other are not simply – uh, you know, giving access to infrastructure because it's cheaper. They've got low. They've got subsidies from the Chinese government, or the Belt and Road program is providing them some uh, capabilities that they wouldn't otherwise have. That's where we really need to make a strategic move as a nation to help protect our own national security, that of our allies. Uh, a lot of time on cyber issues uh, the last several years, um, and and you're you're deeply involved in the issue uh, in in multiple ways. I'm I'm wondering if you can give us without without getting into anything classified, obviously, sure. if you can give us a sense of how serious um, this hacking threat from China is. You know, there there's what you necessarily see uh, in the press, whether it, it's in the Wall Street Journal or on CNN or whatever. But in in my experience, at least, sometimes the headlines can be misleading. Sometimes they don't give you the the, the full story. Give us a sense, if you can, about just exactly how aggressive and how successful uh, the PRC intelligence service has been with respect to hacking, going after some of the very kinds of things that Derek has talked about here with respect to, you know, intellectual property uh, on, on the commercial side, but also uh, the threat on the government side to U.S. personnel and to U.S. activities. Yeah, look, it's it's hard to overstate uh, the threat that um, cyber hacking and cyber activities by the Chinese government pose uh, to the United States and to our national security. Uh, let's talk about a couple of different things. First, there's uh, hacking uh, against the U.S. government. Uh, and then there's hacking against U.S. private sector companies and our allies. And then, of course, there's a differentiation between hacking on one hand, uh, which I would describe as stealing information, uh, stealing intellectual property and the like. And then attacks, which are potentially destructive or disruptive or manipulate information and cause systems to be unavailable or unusable or unreliable. And so let's differentiate between those th these things. Let's focus, focus first on hacking. Let's talk about government hacking, right? Chinese efforts to obtain government information uh, for the purpose of understanding our plans and intentions. So let's just be honest, right? We all do it, right? The U.S. does it to China. The U.S. does it to Russia, Iran, North Korea, and they do it to us. This is part of the the, the great game of intelligence. Um, you know, there was that old saw back in the back, you know, whatever, 40 years ago that quote unquote gentlemen or gentle ladies don't read each other's mail. And we all knew at the time that wasn't the truth. We read each other's mail. Uh, we read each other's email. Uh, we try to hack into their systems. They try to hack into ours. That's the nature of the business. And so uh, to the extent that the Chinese government is engaged in that, they're very good at it. If I were to rank the top three nations today in that type of intelligence collection, it's the United States right at the top. Uh, Russia and China right behind us and and moving up with a bullet. Um, and so while we remain, I think the best, uh, it's fair to say, uh, the Chinese and Russians are right there uh, coming at us and coming after us. And we're trying to defend against that. So, but look, that's all fine, right? I don't have a problem uh, we, you know, with the Chinese coming and trying to get, steal our government information because we try to steal theirs too. That is the nature of the business. That's sort of fair, right? So when the Chinese government, I don't like it, don't get me wrong, right? 
when the Chinese government was able to successfully hack into uh, uh, you know, the U.S. Uh, a personnel office and steal all this information about, um, uh, about uh, you and me and everyone else who held a security clearance and take all that data, it's, it's horrible and awful and will enable human, very highly sophisticated cyber and human intelligence operations for decades to come against some of our most important uh, possessors of classified information. It's a massive problem. But honestly, if we had the chance to do it, we absolutely would have done it every day since Saturday and Sunday and over and over again, because that's what nations do. And so, you know, if they do well at that, fair, we need to do better at defending and we want to do the same thing to them. Where it becomes hugely different and problematic is when we talk about, A, cyber theft from private sector companies, and particularly when that cyber theft is being utilized uh, to not just empower the nation state, but to empower their economic engine, right? China is building their economy on the backs of American investment in intellectual property and American innovation. Well, to be candid, the Chinese communist government and their companies cannot innovate as fast as we can. It's our strategic advantage. We can't beat them in quantity of people. We can't beat them in a lot of things. What we can beat them on is speed of innovation. But if all that innovation and the billions of dollars our private sector companies are investing in innovation and R&D are walking out the back door to China, well, that's not just a massive economic security issue, which it is. It's a massive national security issue. And the Trump administration was right to call it economic security as, a, as an element of national security. And so, you know, when you when you ask somebody like uh, General Keith Alexander, uh, the CEO of the company that I work at, IronNet, I'm um, in the former director of the NSA, the founding commander of U.S. Cyber Command, a decade ago almost, he said it was the greatest transfer of wealth in modern human history. And that statement was reiterated just about a year ago by the FBI director, Chris Ray. Let me say it again. The greatest transfer of wealth in modern human history is the transfer of wealth from the United States to China because of their cyber, cyber, cyber enabled intellectual property theft. So it's a huge problem. Um, and it's a huge economic and national security problem. For the United States. And then finally, what I'll say is uh, both against the public sector and the private sector, when we transition from theft and whether it's intellectual property or government information, when we transition to cyber attack, the disruption of systems, taking them offline, making data unreliable because you're not sure if you can trust it because it's been manipulated, right? Um, uh, the bricking of computer systems, the, the deletion of data, that type of stuff, which I would refer to as a cyber attack, and includes, by the way, some of these ransomware attacks that take systems offline and make them inoperable, right? That is a huge problem because that is fundamentally different, in my mind, than when we talk about cyber theft and, and, and stealing of stuff, whether government or private sector. And that becomes really problematic. We know uh, both the Russians and Russian criminals in, in, uh, in Russia have been active in that. And the idea that the Russian government doesn't know or isn't aware or frankly isn't supportive of those activities is crazy. Nothing happens in Vladimir Putin's Russia without him and his cronies knowing about it. And the same is increasingly true of China. We've seen now uh, uh, numerous Justice Department inv indictments talking about this newly budding relationship between the Chinese criminal enterprises, the Chinese government, and their, and their, uh, their, their sort of permissive environment they're providing to these actors. And so if you start seeing an uptick in ransomware and the like from China, it shouldn't surprise you. It's not just an effort to make money for the pocketbooks of these criminals. More often than not, these are folks who work in the government during the day, work for their own pocketbook at night, and sometimes are implementing government decision-making and desires as part of this criminal activity. And so that's an important trend to watch out for. Uh, but I do want to make sure that we're differentiating between cyber attacks on one hand, cyber theft on the other, and between on the cyber theft side, government on one hand, and, and, and theft of intellectual property from the private sector on the other. That's a great rundown. And, you know, I, I want to, again, kind of bring this back, you know, ultimately to the human element. Um, you know, we have this enormous exchange of essentially scientific knowledge and talent um, between the two countries in the areas uh, of, of cyber, uh, of computer technology, all the rest of that. Um, there's without question, you know, Chinese scientists, researchers, um, I'm talking now specifically Chinese nationals. Um, I'm not talking about Chinese Americans in this context. I'm talking about Chinese nationals, um, you know, who are coming to this country, uh, some of whom will go on to actually get green cards and maybe even become American citizens, but many of whom, you know, will not. Do you have concerns um, of the kind that, that I asked Derek about with respect to uh, individuals, you know, with, with scientific and particularly computer backgrounds? Um, coming to this country to do research, uh, potentially, you know, under the guise uh, of, of something legitimate, 
but who may in fact ultimately be acting on behalf of, of the Ministry of State Security or another element of the PLA. You, do you have those concerns? Look, absolutely. I mean, I, we don't have to, you know, trust my gut instinct on it. The reality is in, you know, is in the indictments that the Justice Department has issued time and time again uh, of Chinese nationals coming to the United States um, and, 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 and serving as scholars or students at American universities and stealing uh, data. Now, is that, the, is that the, the majority of Chinese students or Chinese scholars? Of course not. Is it an important minority? It is. And so we have to be on guard about it. And it's not... Uh, you know, racially insensitive or culturally insensitive or, 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 or biased to say, hey, we have a major nation state that is our largest likely to be peer competitor in the future. We know they are sending people here. They have an entire program to send Chinese nationals to the United States to steal American intellectual property, frankly, to recruit Americans to do the same on their behalf. We saw the, the, the uh, now infamous indictment of a Harvard professor um, who was indicted for being part of this Thousand Talents program uh, coming out of China. So it's not, it's not theoretical. It's very real and practical. And so the question becomes, of course, we have to be respectful uh, of people and, and treat people fairly. But it's also not a problem to say, look, we have a very real national security threat. We have to vet people and assess them and make sure that they're not engaged in these activities. And to the extent they are, we revoke their visas, we, we kick them out, and we monitor uh, what, they're, what they're doing on the way in here as they're, as they're here in the United States. The other thing, you know, to be honest with you, uh, that's a larger, even larger problem, Pat, is today, you know, our, our immigration system is fundamentally broken. Right. We this is a nation built of immigrants. Right. Uh, we bring we bring people here all the time to study at the world's greatest universities, to educate them. And more often than not, we force those people to go home and use the education we've given them and the capabilities and, and the skill sets we provided to create innovation and create technology, and create capabilities overseas, oftentimes for foreign governments and and and, and private sector companies that then work with foreign governments abroad. That problem is true in Russia. It's true in Iran. It's true. In, it's not really true in North Korea because they don't send a lot of scholars here. It's very true in China. And you have to ask ourselves, does it make sense to bring students here, give them the best education and say, hey, you must go home, right? And you must innovate abroad and you must create that technological capability and that, and that economic profit abroad. It, it simply seems crazy. And so, you know, I think one thing we have to think about is as we vet people on the way in, as we vet people while they're here, how do we retain that talent and ensure that talent can work in our economic and in our national interest um, while always guarding against this issue of, of potential espionage, right? But again, that's a minority of the population that's coming here. We need to capture the capabilities and skill sets that we're providing, take advantage of that, and then spend the real time focus on the real problem and push those folks out, prevent them from getting here in the first place. And again, it is important that we, that we, that we, we guard ourselves against you know, biases based on ethnicity or background or, or nationality. At the same time, it, it would be silly to not, it, not acknowledge to ourselves that we have a very real threat from, from, chi from China and that it poses as a nation and that they are exploiting that, that uh, our, our willingness to take in folks and, and educate people and bring scholars here um, for their own purposes. We have to be on guard to that. And how you balance those things, like everything in this country, is that balance between uh, the, the, the rights we give our citizens, our nationals, and those who come here, even foreign nationals, and our, and our legitimate national security interests, right? We're always fighting that balance, right? It's not like we don't conduct surveillance against Americans if we fear that they are spies or terrorists or engaged in criminal activity. And the same has to be true of foreign nationals. And we can do that without being accused of a bias based on race, religion, or nationality if we're doing it the right way and we're above board and transparent about what, what we're doing and why we're doing it. Well, I'm, I'm delighted that you brought up uh, the Lieber case uh, in Boston, because what fascinates me now is that uh, the individual who was the U.S. attorney uh, in Massachusetts at the time who brought that case, Andrew Lelling, uh, now appears to be having some real second thoughts uh, about the entire China Initiative program at DOJ. He, he told the Post um, that, uh, quote, if I were in the department today, basically the Department of Justice, uh, he said, I'd tell the field, OK, slow down on new cases. Let's set the bar higher now. When I saw that comment, that really kind of got uh, got the hair on the back of my neck up because it, it certainly implies that the, that the standard for essentially in conducting investigations uh, as it pertains to any kind of connection to China had been lowered in some in some fashion. And he went on to tell I thought this was really good. He went on to tell uh, Law 360 um, Quote, if the point was to scare the expletive out of the entire academic community, the initiative did that. 
they should change or shut down that portion of the program, uh, end quote. And, and that gives me a great opportunity to, to, to turn to uh, uh, Dr. Jeremy Wu. Jeremy is, uh, is a statistician by background and training, uh, and he has spent a lot of time essentially looking at these Department of Justice uh, cases. And he's got uh, a presentation he's going to, to walk us through uh, in just a couple of minutes. But Jeremy, I, I wanted to ask you um, right, out, right out front, um, what, what led you to, to become the founder of APA Justice? You know, what was it that motivated you to make you feel like you needed to, to start that particular organization and, and go in this direction of, of public advocacy on these issues? Um, thank you, Pat, and, and Cato Institute uh, for organizing this uh, forum. Um, I retired from the federal government, um, ready to go for fishing. Um, and during my federal career, I was very fortunate to work on a two-track career between statistics and civil rights. And in 2015, a series of um, Chinese American scientists in private industry, in federal government and academia were accused of passing secrets to China. And all of them, all these cases were dismissed at the end of the day. And uh, the Congressional Asian Pacific American Caucus Chair, Judy Chu, uh, basically were alarmed and she would like to create a forum, a platform, so that information and knowledge about these uh, racial profiling, apparently racial profiling cases, can be communicated faster and more immediately among elected officials, concerned organizations and individuals. And thus, APA Justice, which is just a group of volunteers, was formed in response to that uh, call. And it was formed in the fall of uh, 2015. And little did we know, six years later, we're still dealing with the same issues, if not on a more expanded uh, basis. So that's basically the history of uh, APA Justice and its uh, formation. Um, when did you first learn of, of the China Initiative? Was it just the day that the announcement came out? Um, and, and what essentially has, has APA Justice been doing to focus uh, uh, on, the, on the China Initiative and its impacts on the community? It was literally on the day it was formed on November 1st, uh, 2018. And as part of the APA Justice activities, we have um, monthly meetings. We have issued uh, newsletters. We have organized a series of webinar uh, to bring awareness to the issue. And by the way, one of the partnering organization is Advancing Justice, AJC, um, to which uh, 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 Casella is a staff uh, member, a staff attorney. So through these continuing activities, we try to create and maintain and sustain an ecosystem uh with individuals and organizations and elected officials about the racial profiling issues as well as related justice and fairness issues you flagged for my attention and the attention of a lot of folks some of the work that's been done uh, very very recently uh, by the mit technology review and you have extracted uh, some key uh, data points from that particular data set. And you've got a presentation that you'd like to run through. Uh, David, if we could uh, go ahead and, and get that up for Jeremy now. Thank you, David. Um, my hope is that the graphs, and one graph actually, and some of the statistics will tell us a story and give us a point of reference about the consequences of the China Initiative three years after the initiative was launched uh, three years ago. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, now, 
here I'll be referencing two reports by the MIT Technology Review. Uh, it came out about two weeks ago. Sorry, would you go back to the previous slide? I'm sorry. Now, the titles are pretty much self-descriptive. The first title is The U.S. Crackdown on China Economic Espionage in reference to the China Initiative. It's a mess. We have the data to show it. The second title is We Built a Database to Understand the China Initiative then the government changed its records. Mm -hmm. Now, it's not common for a news media to publish two articles on the same topic on the same day, but the circumstances required it. Next slide, please. Now, starting in spring of uh, this year, MIT Technology Review began to build a database based on DOJ's own online report, court documents interviews with defendants, their families, their attorneys, former prosecutors, lawmakers, civil rights advocates, and other scholars. The reporters contacted me after they have built a rough database. We compare notes. I provided verification and validation. The, the database cover a total of 77 cases and 162 defendants, 148 of them are individuals and the rest are companies. Next slide, please. Now, as a statistician, this is a beautiful graph produced by MIT Technology Review, summarizing the charges of the 77 cases by the year of their filing. Now, remember November, 2018 is when the China initiative was launched. Now, cases shaded in gray cover import export cases, corruption cases, and a catch all category. Shades of orange represent traditional espionage and agent of foreign government cases. Shades of orange, rep, uh, uh, shades of blue and green, I should say, represent hacking, economic espionage, and trade secret cases, which are purportedly the main purpose of the China Initiative. So those are in green and blue. Now, shades of red, which should jump out in this graph, represent primarily so-called research integrity cases. That includes the academics filling out forms incorrectly, making false statements to federal agents, and various fraud charges, including Charles Lieber's charge of uh, uh, tax fraud charges. Now, only two out of about two dozen research integrity cases were charged for trade secret, thefts, and agent of a foreign government. Next slide, please. Now, this slide shows the primary findings of the first MIT Technology Review article. I'll highlight a few of them here. The first one is, there's no official definition of what a China initiative case is and how it's categorized, okay? And this becomes very uh, important as uh, we, we uh, proceed with the other points. The second thing is focus is moving away from economic espionage and hacking to research integrity as indicated by the red bars in the previous chart. And third, about one third of the research integrity cases have been dropped or dismissed. And fourth, about 90% of the defendants are of Chinese her heritage. Now it's not exactly 100%, but it's getting pretty close to it. And, and Charles Lieber is one of the remaining 
And finally, DOJ does not list all the cases it believes to be part of the China Initiative. And this very point explains why MIT Technology Review had to publish a second article on the same day. Next slide, please. It was mid-November when the reporters completed their first report and requested comments from DOJ on a long list of questions. Two days after they presented the questions, the DOJ online report was abruptly changed by adding a few cases, but removing 17 cases, about 17 cases covering 39 defendants. All research integrity cases, this is about one third of the red bars that you saw earlier, that were dismissed or acquitted have now been removed as if they were never in the list or they never occur under the China Initiative. Next slide, please. Professor Amin, whose case was removed from the DOJ online report, he was the first academic to go to trial under the China Initiative. Now, DOJ has always stated that they have strict guidelines to follow facts and evidence before prosecuting a case. But the very first case collapsed totally. According to the FBI agent, the investigation against Professor Hu started with a Google search as he looked for a spy in Knoxville, Tennessee. This abrupt change without explanation or announcement would obviously and substantially alter the characterization and perception of the China Initiative. It explains why a second article was necessary by the MIT Technology Review. Next slide, please. And this will be the last slide. China Initiative has many broader consequences and implications. The damage to individuals like Professor Xi Hu is devastating. There are probably hundreds of academics being prosecuted and investigated at this time. They have chilling effects on open science and international collaboration. Future US STEM workforce and global leadership in science and technology is at stake. The China Initiative actually helps to drive needed talents back to China or to other countries, something China's talent program has not been able to achieve until now. Finally, we must ask, how effective has the massive amount of federal resources and taxpayers' dollars been in catching spies and protecting our national security? With that, thank you, Pat, for this chance of presenting this uh, little story. Well, uh, Jeremy, thanks for running through those numbers. Um, and and I'll, I'll just say that I, I saw a piece from Bloomberg this week where Bloomberg had looked at, you know, at least 50 of these cases and, and came to some, you know, some very similar conclusions. Uh, Jamil, you know, you're the lawyer among us, uh, as well as Gisela here. Um, I'm, I'm taking a look at statements like, you know, there's no definition of what a China initiative case is, and that sets off all kind of alarm bells in my head. You know, for, for those who may not be familiar with, uh, with kind of the intricacies of how the FBI decides what they're going to do or how they're going to characterize a case, they use what's known as a classification system. This started all the way back with J. Edgar Hoover, uh, literally back, back in the day. And they range in numbers literally from one well up through 800. Some of this stuff is still classified. At Cato, we're trying to solve that problem. Uh, we've managed to get uh, a lot more of those classifications uh, declassified at this point. But in essence, you'll see things uh, like in, in the old days, a classification 100 case would be a domestic security case. Um, this was very, a very common usage all through the 1930s up through literally the Nixon administration. A classification 105 case would be a foreign espionage case, things of that nature. So we have essentially within the Bureau a very stratified series of, of ways of essentially classifying particular cases. Jamil, does it 
does it alarm you? Does it bother you? Does it concern you that there was never apparently at the very beginning of this process, some thought about how these cases would be classified? I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, but I don't ever recall seeing a, a program initiated by DOJ that had a country title, right? I, I don't. So, I mean, what, what are your thoughts on this? Well, look, I mean, I think I think there's a few things to be uh, said. One, we should always be concerned about overweening government power, right? I mean, of all the people that were most concerned about overweening government power, it was our framers and our founders, the people who created this nation, who rebelled against the uh, the uh, the inappropriate use of government power by the king. And so we should always be on guard about the use of government uh, authority and capability against uh, our people and, and people in this country. Um, and that that at the top of that list is the use of law enforcement power, because uh, in this country, uh, the government has the lawful monopoly on the use of force. And so it, to include imprisoning folks um, and bringing them to trial, which can cause huge issues. And so we should always be careful and ensure our Justice Department, our investigators are doing the right thing right now. The, the question of whether we've ever had a, a name of a country in a, in a title of an investigative case. I mean, look, let's be realistic, right? During the Cold War, uh, we particularly in the in the 80s, we investigated all sorts of Russian nationals um, and folks coming from Russia to the United States uh, for questions of espionage and the like. It is not unusual in any country, including free countries, to be concerned about our nation state adversaries coming after us uh, to uh, to obtain information. And in fact, just uh, just uh, just a, a decade ago, uh, we made public that we had been watching uh, a set of Russian illegals in the United States, people who pretended to be uh, nationals of Canada and and like became, got, obtained U.S. green cards, U.S. citizenship, some uh, who came here under uh, under Russian cover, um, who were operating illegally in this country uh, in an effort to obtain and, and, and gain long term access to American uh, classified information. Um, and so, uh, you know, in, in a long time FBI uh, investigation. So. This idea that we don't focus on nations or nationals of foreign countries who are who are here either legally or illegally uh, for concerns about what their nation is doing is, is simply not true. Right. And are there times when the government prosecutes people or investigates people and those don't stand up in court? Of course. Right. The government loses cases all the time. Does that mean that the government is 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 has is engaged in some sort of inappropriate, illegal, unethical uh, activity? Of course not. Right. There are many, many reasons why uh, the government might lose a case in federal courts. So this idea somehow that, that that's what's going on here, that this is a ethically, ethically or racially or nationally biased set of investigations because the government has lost some cases um, or the like is simply not a fair criticism. And to the question of, you know, uh, was there the right definitions? Can we get better? Of course, we can get better. Should we be more careful about how we bring these investigations? Of course, we should. Does that mean that the entire idea of having a China initiative is flawed? It does not. China has a thousand talents program. They actively are engaged in an ongoing effort to send folks here to steal American, both classified national security secrets, as well as to steal intellectual property and bring that back to China to create an economic engine to rival ours. That is the reality. If you don't believe that, then you'd have a blinkered view of the reality. Now, the question is, what do we do about that? Do we want to engage in ethic and ethically questionable investigations? Do we want to engage in ethnic or nationality bias? Of course not. Should we be on guard of that, on guard against that? Of course we should. Should we not engage in a response to this activity by China? Of course we must. And so it's all like everything in our nation, right? Whether you're investigating terrorism, right? Domestic, uh, domestic terrorism or international terrorism, whether you're investigating Americans engage in espionage on behalf of a foreign government, whether that's Russia, China, Iran, North Korea, or any other government, including some of our allies, which happens and we prosecute, right? You have to be careful and you have to be cautious of American civil liberties, right? Those of our citizens and our nationals, as well as the liberties of, of folks that we grant voluntarily to nationals, foreign nationals who come into this country. And so there's no doubt there's always a balance. But the idea that the Chinese are not actively engaged in a massive, scaled intelligence operation against our country for both national security and economic purposes is simply not realistic. And simply saying, well, they, you know, th this is ethnic bias and we should stop doing it or it's chilling academic engagement, right? The fact of the matter is the Chinese are exploiting our system, our free system, in order to take advantage that's not appropriate, unfair, and, and, and problematic from an economic and national security perspective.
you know, Jeremy, you'll correct me if I'm wrong, but I don't think that um, the DOJ has brought any cases against um, American researchers that have been participating in talent programs offered by Germany, Britain, France, um, uh, Israel, other countries. Am, am I correct on that? That they're, you're not aware of any of those cases? Giselle, that, that question to you as well. I'm not aware of any cases against any other country in terms of talent recruitment programs. And Gisela, you, you, you would concur? I, I'm not aware. And, and I just wanted to respond real quickly. Look, the, the reality is there is no Russian initiative and there was no German incarceration. And I think in many ways as a country, we have to recognize that Asian Americans in the immigrant community have a very unique experience when it comes to national security policies. And they've often been scapegoated. Um, it's not to say that there isn't a threat. Uh, I think we actually have plenty of common ground here. Uh, we all agree that there is a very real threat from China's government, um, a very real humanitarian issue there. But we still need to avoid these broad generalizations that somehow um, all individuals of Chinese or Asian descent are spies or that they're inherently suspicious. And the reality is we have to be very mindful of the role of bias and certain presumptions, there are certain terms that we've seen thrown around, like the whole of society approach, non-traditional collectors. These are extremely problematic. They blur the lines between civilians and agents of the PRC. And, you know, I really want to raise the human component here. I've worked with refugees and asylum seekers. Uh, I've had a previous client who was a Uyghur refugee. And you know, many folks leaving China are there. They left China for a reason. Um, they came to the United States um, seeing a country who would be able to stand up to China, who wouldn't um, essentially deport them back to China like many other countries once there's pressure that they have Uyghur folks there. And so we have to recognize that, you know, just merely having a connection to the PRC, the idea that you could be unwittingly or unintentionally. This captures a broad group of vulnerable populations, folks who want to come to the United States for freedom, who are trying to avoid abuses in China. And so I just wanted to raise that human component uh, and how frightening it is for many of them to find themselves fleeing one country and then now facing uh, this type of situation here in the United States. I do wanna make a note that you know, our organization is predominantly focused on the domestic front um, and not so much you know, the international components that, that Derek and Jamil, I'm sure you have a lot of experience in. But I wanna make a note here that this is an area where rising tensions between US and China are having a direct impact here domestically, whether it's the rise in hate crimes against the Asian American communities, or whether it is this new framework in um, how we're looking at national security and how we're looking at those um, who have ties to China. So I just wanted to, you know, quick briefly respond in that regard. Yeah, G Gisela, when, when did AAJC get its first um, China initiative related case? Um, can, can you kind of talk about how the organization got involved in, in trying to, to help uh, Chinese Americans who've been uh, ensnared in this whole thing? Yeah, and, and I, I think I also want to give sort of a background to what you mentioned, Pat. Our organization actually came into existence at a time when Vincent Chen, who was a Chinese American, was murdered by two white male auto workers who thought that Vincent was Japanese and they had beaten him to death due to rising tensions between the US and China. And so this was an area that wasn't new to us as an organization. And so we had heard concerns from impacted persons, uh, community organizations, and you know we heard from leaders within this community, such as um, Jeremy, that there was a real need to address this. And so we launched the Anti-Racial Profiling Project with the goal to make sure that access to legal counsel was available to folks and that they had support in navigating what is a very complicated space. You know, many of these individuals, as you've seen from Jeremy's um, slide, there has been an increase in the focus on academics, on these research integrity cases. Uh, but they don't know how to navigate this on the legal side. It is a very complicated process. 
So, um, you know, it's we, we've just passed our one year anniversary. We have helped over 70 impacted persons, whether it's providing them with legal referrals or um, assisting them in the advocacy space. And a common thing that we hear, not even just from the folks whose cases we take up on um, to assist, but also from folks who are just expressing their fear. The reality is, regardless of whatever strategy it is that um, the United States has in handling the, the tensions between the two countries, there is a chilling effect here on the ground domestically. Uh, people are worried that they have not even done any single mistake but that somehow they'll face extra scrutiny, not just only because they're of Chinese descent, but be also because of their Asian descent. You know, anti-China sentiment has a very unique relationship with the Asian American community. Chinese immigration isn't just happening in the Western hemisphere. This is something that has been going on in Asia for hundreds of years. You know, the Philippines has the oldest Chinatown. This impacts folks from East Asia, Southeast Asia, and we see how the ways that Asians are treated as a monolith in the United States also means that this is going to impact us, impact uh, how safe we feel when we walk down the street. And also now we're seeing impact the ways in which uh, how we feel with our employers, whether we're going to find ourselves investigated. So we're not saying that there isn't an issue, but that chilling effect and that fear is very real in this community. And we have to also understand the role that racial bias will take place, especially when you have an initiative focused on just one country, and especially when that country is China. And so I want to raise that, you know, these are things that we're hearing on the ground. Folks who are finding themselves in very difficult financial situations, who have to sell their home to continue with these litigation efforts. And so we have to be very mindful in the way that the Department of Justice uses their process discretion to decide on these cases. We should be focused on real national security threats. We shouldn't be doing this situation where we're inciting fear among academics across the whole country. I very much agree with what Jamil had mentioned earlier, which is we're a country of immigrants and we should be encouraging people that we have educated to stay here in this country. But our current environment here, not just with the China Initiative, but certainly starting with that, the current environment we have in the United States is we're disincentivizing students from staying. We're disincentivizing immigrants from naturalizing. I, I hear from folks who don't even want to go through the naturalization process. That sort of fear is not helpful. It's not helpful for our national security. It's not helpful for our economic competition. And for us as a civil rights group, you know, this is something concerning because, like I mentioned, this is not new to the Asian American community. When we have um, you know, the first immigration uh, laws, um, discriminatory laws, we really focused against those of Chinese descent. And that had deeply impacted our population here as an Asian American entity. And certainly we don't know the extent to which some of the growing fear that we're seeing right now within the community, how that's going to impact our community as a whole, as a political entity, how many new Americans we're not going to be having, how many young scholars are not going to decide to work for the federal government. And the reality is we need more Asian Americans working within the federal government. We need, you know, more diversity. And so that that is, you know, just a few of the issues I wanted to raise um, to give more of a voice and perspective on at least how many within the Asian American community is viewing this issue. So, Jamil, I, th I think one of the, the other things that has really kind of concerned me deeply about all of this is that I I'm not aware, and, and if anybody on this panel has information to the contrary, please definitely speak up, but I'm not aware that anybody from DOJ actually sat down in 2014, 2015, 2016 and said, you know what? We really ought to have the Civil Rights Division uh, and maybe the Community Relations Service kind of go out to all the colleges and universities in this country that have got science, technology, engineering, and mathematics programs and give them briefings, basically a counterintelligence briefing on, on what they should be concerned about uh, with respect to this stuff. I, I don't, I, if, if, if anybody has any information to the contrary that they did that before they started these prosecutions, I would love to see that. Uh, isn't that really something, Jamil, that they should have 
thought through much better at the very beginning of this. They, they should have been reaching out to say, we have concerns. And I, I don't want to, I don't, I don't want to take a program like the Bridges Initiative um, at, at DOJ, which is very controversial, uh, justifiably so, among the Arab and Muslim American communities. Um, a lot of that has been viewed essentially as an intelligence gathering operation. However, things like the Community Relations Service um, and the Civil Rights Division exist for reasons um, at DOJ. And I guess I'm trying, I'm really struggling to understand why it is if there were all these concerns about this ramping up, the systematic ramping up uh, of PRC efforts to engage in this kind of activity and, and specifically targeting, you know, American university researchers potentially for recruitment and all the rest of that. Why wasn't there a push out of DOJ to sensitize faculty, administrators, et cetera, about the threat before just, you know, suddenly showing up with subpoenas and, and kicking in doors and all the rest of that? I, Am I off base here? It, it just seems to me that a lot more thought should have gone in to the whole approach to this problem. Yeah, uh, look, Pat, the idea that the idea that the U.S. Justice Department is showing up, kicking in doors at universities is false. So let's not even say that because it's not true, right? That's not what's going on here. Um, and that's not what happened in the China Initiative. And it's not an actual you know, description of the reality on the ground. What is happening here is that, you know, I mean, you almost have to have been having lived under a rock for the last decade. If you haven't, if you're at a university or an academic or have been anywhere around the U.S. government or the national security community to not know that China's engaged in massive scale IP theft and espionage against the United States. Right. You can look on the front page of any newspaper in any given month of the last three years, or the last decade, in fact, and the U.S. government's been talking actively about that. So nobody's confused about what's going on. The fact of the matter is that the Civil Rights Division wouldn't be the right place to go to uh, the academic community because the Civil Rights Division is is in the position of enforcing uh, our laws against discrimination. They're not the ones who have counterintelligence information going to going to uh, academia and the like. And the idea that the FBI has not gone to academia and not gone to universities and explained uh, the counterintelligence threat, that happens constantly. There are constant communications going on. Let's be honest. I work in academia. I can tell you, academics are not interested in those conversations. They're not interested in talking to the Bureau more often than not in a lot of circumstances. And again, I'm overgeneralizing. Let's be clear. There are a lot of academics that work closely with the government. We're closely with the intelligence community. We're closely with the FBI. But the average run of the academic to whom you come to and say, hey, you need to be thinking about the scholars that are coming here. Let us show you about Thousand Towns program. Most university administrators and most academics are like, you know, I'm good. You know, don't really want to have those conversations. And even now today, the conversation in academia, as we've seen some of these prosecutions move forward, these efforts go forward is, oh, we're being chilled. Our efforts to be scholars is being chilled. Rather than the conversation being, oh, we might have a problem. How do we help address that problem and continue our academic efforts while also uh, addressing these things? And look, uh, we have a sordid history as a nation when it comes to uh, bias against minorities, Asians in particular, right? You need only look back at, the, at World War II and our treatment of Japanese Americans, our outrageous treatment of Japanese Americans, our internment of them in, 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 in modern day gulags uh, on, the, on the California shore, right? Our historic treatment uh, that was referred to of Chinese nationals coming to this country, right? We have a lot to be apologetic for and, and, and to blame ourselves for and to be on guard against in the modern era. And I think that's exactly right. We need to be very cautious about that and be skeptical of, of, of efforts at the Justice Department, the FBI, and the use of law enforcement power. At the same time, ignoring the fact that China has focused on our academic sector for these very reasons, because they know it's hard for us to focus on academia. They know it's hard for us to do investigations. They know the academic community is going to, is going to complain about academic freedom and raise concerns about scholars and the chilling effect and the like. They are using that very fact to exploit our system. So that doesn't mean that we shouldn't, we shouldn't be on guard about it. Of course we should. But it also means we can't simply throw the race card when we're responding to a very real national security threat. We have to do both. We have to balance our security against the very legitimate concerns and the chilling concerns that have been raised about uh, potential bias and the chilling effect it has on Asian Americans in this country. Being an Asian American myself of Muslim descent, I can tell you, it was tough living in this country after 9-11 and the investigations that took place. It doesn't mean we didn't have to engage in those investigations. We have to, as a nation, figure out how to balance those things and engage in, in just these conversations to get to the right place. I, I think we need to make it clear that, that we should be doing properly predicated 
investigations. I, I, I think that Correct. that's what we really need to be clear about. Um, we have a, a comment here from, uh, from one of our folks watching today. Uh, I'm going to read this verbatim. Quote, I have known about 10 established Chinese American scientists who have left this country permanently in the past two years. To your attention, they were not even under investigation, end quote. That goes to exactly the phenomenon that, that Jeremy uh, and Gisela have been talking about here. Um, Gisela, one of the most recent cases um, that really, I think, got an enormous amount uh, of press attention uh, involves Professor Anming Hu, who was at the University of Tennessee at Knoxville, also, interestingly, like Dr. Lieber, a nanotechnology expert. Um, you've had a, a lot of interaction uh, uh, with Dr. Hu, and you're very familiar with his case. Can you kind of walk us through that particular case and that episode and exactly how it all came about and how Dr. Hu and his family have been, have been dealing with it ever since? Yeah, thank you, Pat. And, and I'll, I'll try to provide um, briefly a bit of a background on Professor Hu's case um, to, to the extent that I can, and also raise some of the key concerns. So as many of you know, Professor Hu was a professor at the University of Tennessee um, he had recently been acquitted, and I, I want to make it very clear that it, it is it is a a huge decision that the judge acquitted um, this case, and a testament to what Professor Hu has been saying all along, which is that he was innocent. But I want to make it clear that Professor Hu, there was no evidence being raised in terms of economic espionage, um, and Professor Hu was actually previously, and this is something that is common for many academics actually encourage, you know, to, to do many of these um, grant proposals to apply from federal grant money from government agencies like NASA and NSF. And we do see this pattern where um, the DOJ will essentially push forward a charge, whether it's false statement or wire fraud, under the theory that folks, if they don't fully disclose everything, are essentially stealing from the federal government. Uh, what it doesn't take into account is the fact that we lack very uniform policies when it comes to federal grant applications, uh, whether it's from the federal agency side or from universities, and that in fact many folks have been encouraged to have uh, collaborations. And so Professor who had been transparent from the very beginning in his preparation of a NASA grant proposal in 2016. He had provided a letter of the um, Chinese professor clearly stating any collaborations and that he wanted to participate on the NASA grant project. He gave the, lesser, the letter to the grant um, officer uh, and they had both told uh, Dr. Hu that that Chinese professor could not be involved in the grant that was the first time Dr. Who had heard about language of the NASA restriction. And the grant process continued. Um, and in fact, UTK administrator were the ones who told Dr. Who that UTK did not consider the NASA Chinese restriction applied to UTK faculty. Uh, that law was very vague. Um, it, it, the actual language uh, prohibited uh, NASA from using funds um, or, or any grant of any kind with China or any Chinese owned companies. Um, and so fundamentally his case had really fallen apart. Um, Dr. Who had been transparent throughout. Um, he lacked the intent that was required. And I want to raise something that has really been an issue for, um, not just professor who, but many others, which is government surveillance, right? So the FBI had actually uh, conducted undercover surveillance of Dr. Who, and not just Dr. Who, but also his college student son for over a year and a half. Uh, when they didn't find any evidence of economic espionage, that's when you saw that they raised these other um, accusations with regards to essentially what was rooted on a non-disclosure issue. Um, Non-disclosure issues has been something that has been very concerning for academics throughout. The idea that you can make some sort of mistake or that something that had been previously encouraged could now potentially lead to a federal criminal investigation or years in prison is not something that many of these professors had signed up for. And so I wanted to raise that, you know, um, Pat had also mentioned, you know, are folks getting these presentations? Well, in the case of Professor Who, FBI and DOE agents had provided uh, presentations 
Um, and one of the main uh, concerns uh, from Professor Hu's side was essentially that many of these um, points within these presentations were false or misleading and gave this presumption that somehow Dr. Hu was an agent of um, the Chinese government or part or associated with the Chinese military. And so we're not saying here, um, you know, in, in cases uh, that we shouldn't be looking uh, or that the government shouldn't pull, be pulling resources, but an understanding that there are many cases like Professor Hu that should not have been brought up that has resulted in um, years of him being, you know, uh, subjected to very unjust treatment from the federal government and it has impacted his career. It has impacted his immigration status here in the country. And so these are not um, light cases. These are very deeply problematic. And so really what our organization turns to is why are many of these cases um, going into the criminal uh, investigation? Why are we not looking into uh, civil remedies or administra administrative remedies for many of these cases that are in reality not rooted in illegal activity, but actually in some sort of paperwork issue? And also that this is very important to be able to provide professors with opportunities to go back and make these corrections if our policies and laws are going to be changing. And certainly, like I mentioned, there has been a huge shift. Um, you know, if this shift occurs, we need to give academics the opportunity to be able to adjust. Um, this is not a gotcha moment. This, this it has to be done in collaboration. It has to be done in ways where folks are actually being trained in how to properly fill out these forms. And certainly, of course, our organization also believes that we should end the China Initiative, that it is fundamentally deeply problematic, um, that it has resulted really in a deterioration of trust uh, between the Asian American community and the federal government. And so I just wanted to raise that. And Professor Hu is not the only one. We have other cases, many who are too scared to really speak out. We've heard of instances of folks who you know, are scared of any backlash um, from their universities, backlash from the federal government. These are folks that we hear don't feel safe going back to China. Um, like I said, many folks left for a reason. And so we have to be really cognizant of that human element and also the responsibilities that our country has in living up to our values and being able to provide um, safety, being able to create incentives for people to contribute and bring their talents here uh, to the United States. We have, you know, talked in some measure today about this whole issue of, of IP theft. And what I'm, what I'm trying to understand essentially is how can we, there is the, the national security and the intelligence side of this that, that Jamil has addressed, and that's one part of it. Um, that's in many respects playing defense, if you will. What, what can we do, what tools are available to the United States essentially to try to modify China, uh, PRC uh, government behavior to lead to an actual demonstrable reduction in these efforts? You know, can they, I, I know I, I've, I've read a lot of what you've uh, written on this. Um, you're not a big fan of tariffs, neither are we at Cato. Um, as you know, uh, but are there some targeted measures that, that could actually work here to shut down IP theft or at least degrade their ability to engage in it and, and that we would have at least some measure of confidence might actually have an impact? Yeah, I mean, you know, let's, let's do a little history that might be relevant to a question you brought up earlier, um, and then I'll get right to, to, to directly to your point. We had a, a period of time, I do not like the Trump administration's China policy, so let me be clear about that. We had a period of time under the Obama administration where we didn't really have a China policy. And then we had an overreaction in some extent when the Trump administration took over because we were responding to years uh, uh, of, of Chinese uh, economic espionage that we just went unaddressed. And we thought we could negotiate with Xi Jinping over, the negotiations failed miserably uh, in terms on the ground. Uh, and I think I think we may have uh, 
jump too quickly in some aspects of, of the Trump administration. Thus, getting back to your point about why we didn't we go around and talk to people and start an education program, we should have done that in 2010. Uh, and by the time we got to 2017, the people who were upset about this were not interested in education anymore. They were interested in action. So that's just a you know a general comment. Um, with regard to the Trump administration, uh, you know, I, I was there. The original start of the 301, which launched tariffs, was supposed to be about IP. That's what the 301 was supposed to be about. And the argument that I made uh, in the White House at the time was, look, we don't have to get every Chinese bad IP actor. What we have to do is get cases where we have good evidence and bring the hammer down on those players, hurt them so that other actors at least face the prospect of deterrence. And that requires research. And I said, I have some research. I'm sure you guys have more research. Maybe, maybe not. Um, but we can start with, with 30 actors. Uh, and that will not solve the problem. There will still be economic espionage. There will still be IP threats, uh, IP theft and coercion. But it will reduce the problem. And we will learn more as we go along. You know, Cato, AEI, we don't like giant government programs launched from the start. We want to be cautious in our intervention and figure out, okay, we shouldn't do this, this worked, and so on, and we'll get better at it. Um, and unfortunately, what happened is the president heard all this, I wasn't there for that, and said, that sounds complicated, I like tariffs, and that was the end of, of, of that action. Um, so we had a program we could have undertaken, and we still could. It's not dramatic, it's not easy for a national level politician to come forward and make a big speech about, uh, but it would discourage some Chinese IP theft by saying, country in a there are, ben there are beneficiaries in China that we can identify, not in all cases, maybe not even in most cases, but in some cases where we can identify with some uh, considerable accuracy. And we can get corporate uh, cooperation in that as long as their names are hidden. And if we really seriously punish those firms where we have good evidence, it's going to discourage other behavior. It's going to discourage the, hey, go dig up some seeds near Monsanto, you know, a, Mon a Monsanto facility, which is really minor stuff. But if there's a possibility that the recipient Chinese agriculture firm gets gets sees international financial sanctions, they won't do it. So, you know, my answer is, you know, I'm not proposing uh, targeting Chinese beneficiaries with with a variety of U.S. sanctions, depending on the severity of the of the loss as like, oh, it's going to work perfectly. But it would work a lot better than tariffs. And it would be a step where we wouldn't have to worry about this giant as much about this giant universe of Chinese cases. We could shrink them because some of the Chinese practitioners would say that's not worth the risk. And I'll make a, a, a stretch, but but I've seen it on the Chinese corporate side. Chinese corporates have been very tentative in their cooperation with Iran. Um, they do it. Sometimes they will break U.S. sanctions. Sometimes they'll talk to the Iranians. But very large Chinese oil projects in Iran have never gotten off the ground because the Chinese oil companies don't want to run into U.S. unhappiness. Though we can influence Chinese behavior. We can't stop them from doing things we don't like. They're going to continue to have their priorities. Uh, but we can influence their behavior with a more targeted program. We had that option at the beginning of the Trump administration, and we chose differently. The Biden administration has been missing in action on this? Yeah, I'd have to say so. Um, you know, there's a very good defense. If there were a Biden administration official here, they'd say, have you noticed there's a pandemic going on? Um, and, and that's really gotten their 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 attention. There's also a, a serious possibility, you know, possibly a very serious U.S.-China confrontation over Taiwan. But when you're talking about their economic policies, they've been very late. There have been a lot of promises and a little action. You know, to, to give credit to you and Cato for holding this event today, um, we happen to have, a, a, I think, a White House deputies meeting today on final actions to be taken on uh, adding companies to the entity list for enforcing, uh, so limiting ex, uh, technology access, and then in a couple of cases, limiting investment in certain Chinese companies that we think we um, are engaged in improper use of, of technology, so we don't want to fund it. So we may be getting uh, the start of, of, of better Biden administration action on this in 2022. I'm now going to stretch way beyond my area of expertise to say that when you have news stories, which we have today in the Washington Post about U.S. investment, which we have had in the past about U.S. tech support for Chinese surveillance firms, when you have stories like that that say American companies and individuals are helping China do things we don't like and the government is not responding to it, it poisons yeah. the political environment. And more yeah. effective U.S. government enforcement 
would take away some of that poison. It doesn't solve everything. I'm not being naive here. But when you have story after story after story in the Post, in the Wall Street Journal, in the New York Times, again and again and again about, hey, look, the United States is helping China do bad things. That is not helpful to, yeah. to the domestic political situation. So I would just add that if we had a more effective China policy, I think it would indirectly ease some of the concerns we have about hostility towards Asian Americans, in particular Chinese Americans, and about civil rights violations. You know, uh, in this vein that we've just been discussing here, uh, we have uh, a question from one of our viewers. What can private enterprise entities like startups, for example, do to protect this wealth or prevent essentially this wealth transfer uh, that Jamil uh, mentioned on a practical and a tactical basis? And I'll, I'll just open that up to, to anybody who wants to, to weigh in on that. Well, I'll just start because it's the you know, corporate side is my expert area of expertise you really be careful about who your partners are certainly starting with china but not just china um there are definitely people who are not you know chinese companies who would love to steal your data and sell it to the highest bidder regardless of who it is they're they're not picky um so unfortunately it means international cooperation has an extra dimension of threat to it because of cyber um that that's just the way it is so you can't necessarily go to where the highest return is you have to think of the potential losses you can't think about how much money you're going to make next year. You have to think about whether your business will still be in business 10 years from now. I have to say American companies haven't done a great job of this. Um, it's one thing to, to make a calculation that says, look, we're going to take some IP losses in China, but it's worth it to us. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll say, I'll, I'll mention a company. Qualcomm has done this for a long time and they've done it successfully, but a lot of companies cannot do that. Um, and if you, if you go for the big score on access to a market because you have a new product, and you don't protect the product, um, you're, you're going to be sorry. So my answer is you have to be more careful about your international cooperation, it's even to some extent your domestic cooperation. You have to invest more in cyber, which is costly and no one wants to do it. And, and mostly you have to think in this return I'm getting next year, what risk is coming with it? Um, if you're going to maximize your return for a year or two, then you should think of yourself as running a short term business. Any advice, essentially, for anybody thinking about uh, doing business uh, in China, what, what they should be thinking about, uh, particularly if they're in the technology field, things they should be concerned about, looking for? Well, I mean, I don't mean to monopolize this part of the conversation, but I used to tell my clients, if you don't want to have China steal your IP, don't go to China. Unfortunately, that doesn't work anymore. Even if you're here, you're going to have China stealing your IP. So the, the advice here is, 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 is about your product. Is your product something where, the, where China doesn't really care who provides it? If you have an environmental technology product, you have a threat from Chinese competitors who might want your product and they want to drive you out of business, but you don't really have a threat from the government because the government's like, clean the environment up as fast as we can. If you have a product that has a dual use military commercial capability, um, you should consider the Chinese threat to be extremely high. And the whole idea of why you would be allowed to do business in China is to take your technology, not because they love you so much and they want to make you money. So you're going to have to evaluate, you know, if you're thinking about opportunities in China and they're of scale where you want to do some research, look at where China says its strategic um, objectives are. The Chinese will say something like this is a top priority. All efforts should be made to advance technology in this area. That is a clear signal to go out and steal and there'll be no questions asked. It's happened again and again and again. It's not subtle. When it's not a strategic priority, you have a much better environment to keep your IP, to be welcomed as a participant. So that, you know, I would really, if I were an American company, I would start by looking at where the Chinese say, we really need to advance our technology because they're telling you that in that case, you're a target. And when they don't say that, then you have the benefits of the giant Chinese market and you, don't, and you have some competitors to deal with, but you don't have the state coming after you, uh, putting you in an almost impossible position. Jeremy, um, you know, you're, you're part of the Committee of 100 and a number of other organizations uh, that have been concerned about the China Initiative from the very beginning. What, what do you want to see happen uh, going forward, what 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 in your view, what would be like your your top three recommendations at this stage of the game for trying to um, ensure that the privacy and civil liberties uh, and the freedom of association rights uh, of Chinese Americans, uh, particularly researchers, 
working at universities uh, and in major uh, corporations are are protected. Um, and 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 what would your what would your overall arching message to federal officials on this whole issue be? What would what would you like to see? Uh, you know, beyond the, the China initiative itself being ended at DOJ, uh, what what else should be happening in that respect? Um, <clears throat> Pat, uh, that's a good question, and I would start by saying that we need to end the China initiative as it is refine it, review it in, in any way too, but it's not effective at this time in addressing the issue. When I talked to the MIT Technology Review, I basically asked for a balance sheet. What do we gain and what do we lose? And I don't see many gains from the China initiative in terms of catching spies or protecting our national security. This is specifically about the uh, China initiative. Now, there are already those who are impacted. There has to be some redress of that. We need to stop the overreach. We need to stop the, uh, the uh, criminalization, the, the unjust and unfair prosecutions and investigations. Uh, I believe that the government should work with community organizations, scientific organizations, to develop fair and sensible policies. Um, that has been lacking. It has been a very one-sided law enforcement exercise. And, and when you mentioned earlier about uh, working with uh, universities, and I, I use uh, Professor An Ming Hu's case as an example, the FBI agent did reach out to the universities, but it winded up that they could not find a spy in Knoxville, Tennessee, and therefore use force uh, 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 statement and uh, fraud as the prosecution uh, basis, and which eventually proved to be uh, uh, essentially nonsensical. And there was this uh, acquitted. I, I think it's very important for the government to communicate clearly, consistently, what the policies and expectations are. They've been changing over time. If you look back five years, 10 years ago, and collaboration was encouraged with China. And there is a change in policy. And it's not clearly communicated. People have got get caught that a few years ago, they received awards, they were praised for recruiting students to come to the United States and study. And now all of a sudden they are criminalized for something like filling out a form incorrectly. So I would say end the China initiative as it is, redress those who are impacted work with the community and scientific organizations and, and develop fair and sensible policies and, and finally communicate those uh, policies and expectations clearly and consistently. And, and don't we also have a fundamental problem here? And, and this, uh, as I was reading uh, the, the judge's uh, decision in, in the An Ming Hu case to, to acquit and, and dismiss all the counts, don't we have a, a fundamental problem with um, research integrity standards and reporting requirements varying wildly, essentially, from institution to institution? Um, in, in that kind of a circumstance, doesn't it make it even more important uh, if, if the FBI has a legitimate tip here, and I mean a legitimate tip, a legitimate piece of either human intelligence, signals intelligence, et cetera, uh, that a particular individual, you know, might might be problematic. Shouldn't those local FBI field offices really be making the extra effort um, to go to the universities and make sure that they understand what their own university policies are with respect to these these kinds of uh, requirements um, before essentially, you know, charging off to to potentially, you know, make an allegation uh, against an individual? It, it it seems to me that that it ought to be in the bureau's interest fundamentally, to get this kind of stuff right up front, rather than, you know, 
um, not engage and really understand what university policies are. I understand that the, that the law, at least in my understanding of it, is fairly clear on the federal side with respect to what folks need to report. But a lot of that ultimately gets interpreted essentially, you know, by the universities and, and, and by the, the administration uh, officials that run them uh, in terms of how they're actually implemented. So, Jeremy, is that another major problem that needs to be addressed? And, and how does that get addressed? I mean, do, uh, do major uh, bodies representing uh, colleges and universities need to come up with a consistent set of guidelines, if you will, for this kind of thing? Yes, I agree with you, uh, Pat, totally, that the uh, inconsistency among the universities pose a big issue. Now, under the Biden administration, the Office of uh, Science and Technology Policy has started some activities trying to build in some consistency. And they request the comments uh, from the communities and, and uh, receive some um, that I, I believe the comment period closed maybe uh, end of last month. So there are some activities we have also been hearing from um, university administrators, uh, from the University of uh, uh, the Association of uh, University Professors about the need for that consistency. So the discussion has started and, and I'm glad that they have started and so they need to be addressed uh but it's still some ways at this point to reach that consistency in terms of how big a role federal government should play how much law enforcement should be a part of it or any part of it and and those are some of the discussions that are ongoing at this time we have a uh, another comment uh from uh, someone online here uh, this this appears to be um, uh, directly on point for, for what we've just been discussing. This individual says, this is just a comment. There should be two approaches and legal frameworks here, one to address non-citizens who are foreigners and the other to address American citizens and or legal residents. I think this distinction needs to be the starting point for how to address foreign espionage by the PRC. I want to turn to the two lawyers on our panel, uh, Jamil, you first, then Gisela. What, what do you think of, of this individual suggestion here about some kind of dual track framework, legally speaking, on these issues? Well, look, I think as a general matter, we do understand that um, American citizens and American nationals have different rights under our laws than foreign nationals. Although when you're talking about people in the United States, uh, foreign nationals who have admitted voluntarily to the United States, we typically tend to think of them having the same rights. Now, whether that's right or wrong, um, that is our normal and, and our general framework. And so uh, while I think uh, the questioner is right to raise uh, this distinction between foreign nationals uh, you know, who are here on visas, uh, and the like, um, and, and that we may have, we may want to and ought to have closer scrutiny of, I think that we need to be very cautious about, uh, as Gisela and Jeremy have, have quite reasonably laid out, the impact of what we do with respect to foreign nationals on uh, uh, Americans of the same of the same background or descent. Um, and we can't ignore uh, those, that, that, that reality. At the same time, the fact of the matter is that foreign nationals are here at our discretion at our government's uh, uh, you know, invitation. And we have the ability to revoke uh, their ability to be here and we have the ability to uh, vet them on the way in and, and while they're here. And so, um, uh, you know, and at the end of the day, the, Amer the American legal framework as a general matter, um, for example, take the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act, treats American citizens and American nationals, US persons, differently than it treats foreigners, whether abroad or in the United States, although if in the United States there are certain uh, protections that do apply that go beyond what would apply to a foreigner overseas. Um, and so I, I don't think your questioner is wrong, but I do think we do need to be on guard uh, uh, about the potential spillover effects on our own communities here and be care very careful to guard against those. Giselle? Yeah, I think in many ways, Jamel and I are on the same page in this area. Um, and I also want to raise that um, it, it, the, the key point is not how they're treated um, differently, but how sort of an indictment against them, how what sort of consequences that's going to have on them based on their immigration status here in the United States. 
if you're a United States citizen, you're, you're not going to be facing the same sort of immigration consequences as someone who has not been fully naturalized. And that is really the case for many folks like Professor Hu and other professors who um, did not finish that, you know, potentially they were on their way uh, towards naturalizing and becoming a United States citizen. This poses um, a lot of complications for, for them in the future. Certainly there are folks who are going to be deported. There are folks who are going to face issues once they do apply for naturalization. Um, and certainly there have been concerns raised by other, um, you know, uh, civil rights and liberties groups, especially those working in the tech space on denaturalization efforts. Um, and so each individual will face different consequences based on their status here. Um, but it's also important to note that this is something that is impacting um, Americans, uh, permanent residents, um, in addition to uh, foreign nationals. Uh, we're, uh, we're beginning to get uh, a little bit uh, short on time here. Um, so I, I think it would probably be a, a good opportunity for me to kind of begin to go around and, and just let each of you kind of offer uh, some concluding thoughts here um, uh, about essentially where, where we should go from here, what you would like to see ultimately uh, in terms of, of a resolution of, of the kinds of issues that we're talking about. Um, Giselle, I'll, I'll start with you. Thank you, Pat. Um, and I really appreciate being here with my uh, other esteemed panelists. I think on our end, as a civil rights organization, one that um, really has worked for many years to advance the rights of Asian Americans and immigrants in this country, uh, we really need to reflect on how initiatives like this and how the current environment in the United States is impacting uh, the Asian American community uh, on all levels, uh, not just scientists, but many youths who are trying to decide, um, you know, how they, what they want to do and what, what are their dreams and where they want to work. Um, the Department of Justice China initiative is extremely problematic. We don't believe that there's a, a fixing to it. Uh, we think it really needs to end um, and we need to conduct a review. This has been going on for three years. Uh, folks have many questions. Uh, we need to look into uh, many of these cases that were closed prior to prosecution. Uh, we need to ask questions like in Professor Hu's case and in Dr. Feng Tao's case that is coming up on how the FBI has been handling this. Are federal prosecutors being influenced by race, ethnicity, or national origin? We're not saying that um, someone is there um, purposely picking uh, specific individuals, but certainly racial bias um, has an important role and, and is a deep concern in our community for this. A second is a better understanding on what premise folks are opening up these investigations um, and an understanding on the surveillance activities. Have they given rise to ways, uh, abuse or to a level of harassment? And certainly we have to address uh, many of the concerns that academics have raised that federal prosecutors are essentially bolstering what are otherwise uh, weak cases. Um, certainly for Professor Hu's case, there was questions of whether this was started based on a false premise. Uh, for Dr. Tao's case, there was a question on the evidence that was being brought forth and uh, what the FBI had communicated to the federal judge. And this is something that's going to be a long-term problem. It doesn't end um, just with one program. Uh, we really need to look at this holistically uh, within our federal government. We need to examine procedures that will find ways to improve and eliminate bias. And at the same time, we need to address the real harms that have already happened. Uh, certainly Jeremy has raised this um, you know, idea of some sort of compensation, but also we need a cure period, right? Things have changed. Academic collaboration, there is a push and there is a shift. We need to give professors an opportunity to be able to go back and adjust their forms accordingly. Uh, and also an understanding in the ways that anti-China rhetoric uh, directly impacts the Asian American community, um, incites hate and violence and certain presumptions. And so this really has to be an area where we need a lot of nuance in approach 
We all understand that there is a threat coming from the PRC, but we also need to understand the ways it's impacting us here domestically and how we can continue to make sure that our efforts to protect our national security aligns with our values as a country. Thank you, uh, Giselle. Jeremy, your concluding thoughts for us? Thank you, Pat, and uh, thank all the uh, fellow uh, panelists. I'll use a quote from one of my mentors, and he's pretty prominent. And basically, he said, the United States is a great country, not because it's perfect, but because it can correct its mistakes. China initiative is a mistake. And the label itself is as unacceptable as China virus. Why is that important? Because that label puts a crosshair on the heads of Asian Americans. And when you come down to it, when anti-Asian hate violence and incidents from the shooting incidents in Atlanta to just getting sped on in a subway station or a subway train, there's no distinction between whether that person is a US citizen or a permanent resident or Chinese national in the United States. I think that is the part that we have been lacking in the China initiative, the human side. And we have been lacking in the balance. We need to emphasize no doubt about a threat from China or any other foreign country to our national security, to our economic security. But we also have to work on the basis of our nation in terms of accountability, in terms of transparency, in terms of integrity, because that is our talent recruitment program. For generations after generations, this nation is a, a nation of immigrants because of those values that attract talents that build this country. And I hope the country will recognize its mistakes and make those corrections. Thank you, Pat. Jeremy, thank you. Uh, Jamil? Yeah, thanks, Pat. Um, look, I think uh, I think Jeremy and Giselle have raised some really important things that we need to think about going forward um, as we think about uh, both the threat that China poses uh, to our uh, national security, and by China in this case, I mean the communist Chinese government and its policies posed to the United States, our economic and our national security, uh, and the reality that China as a nation and as a government, the Chinese communist government is actively engaged in not only uh, active espionage efforts directed at our government, but active espionage efforts uh, focused on our private sector industrial base, not just simply to get military secrets or information about weapons systems or the like, but specifically to obtain high technology intellectual property in an effort to stoke their own economy at the detriment of the United States economy. Um, we also have to recognize the Chinese government's active efforts are, are, are directed at American academia uh, and American researchers um, and, and bringing scholars from China to the United States and students from China to the United States to engage in this act of espionage activity. At the same time, Jeremy and Giselle are 100% correct that we cannot allow that concern about what the Chinese Communist government is doing and the scholars it's sending, the students it's sending, and the operatives it's utilizing, Americans and non-Americans alike to collect intelligence in the United States, both of the private and public sector variety, to turn into a simple cover for racial or national bias. That is not who we are as a nation, is not who we should be as a nation, and we should constantly be on guard against that type of threat to our privacy and our civil liberties by the Justice Department, by the FBI, by the intelligence community. We should also expect from our government uh, you know, them to behave in a way that is respectful of our, of our laws um, and structure and call them out when they don't do those things and when, when they engage in activities that are problematic. But we should also recognize that we have to find a balance between the issue of national security and economic security on one hand and the protection of our of our citizens, our nationals and foreign nationals who come to this country under uh, U.S. government visa and scholar programs. 
So look, these are difficult questions. We have a lot to chew on here. Uh, but the truth of the matter is, we are on the, on the cusp of a very real and very problematic national security threat going forward. We cannot allow our concerns about those na that nation, China in particular, its government and its activities to turn into racial bias. But we must be on guard against and protect both our national security and our civil liberties at the same time. Derek, you got the first word. You're going to get the next to last word. <laughs> Almost. Um, I should say I am not qualified to, to talk about the China Initiative's future. I'm a little more qualified uh, thanks to my colleagues on the panel, but I, I don't think I'm nearly as qualified as them. Uh, I'm going to start one step above that uh, with the academic community. And by this, I don't mean the people being charged uh, rightly or wrongly. Uh, I, I mean their bosses. I mean the university administrators. I mean university presidents. Um, I deal with a lot on the corporate side. On the corporate side, it's fake naivete. Oh, there's this problem? Well, if you pass the law, we'll just do what you want. Meanwhile, they're lobbying against the law furiously. So it's fake. On the academic side, I think it's mostly real. I mean, I, I, you know, I, I, I went to three major American universities, which is probably one too many. Um, and I have a lot of friends in the academic community and some of their responses are just absurd. It's not, it's not, oh, we need Chinese money. It's, I don't understand how you can uh, interfere with wonderful academic collaboration. And I'm like, who do you think you're talking to on the other side? Um, it, that has to change. And again, I, I think, I don't want to put words in anyone's mouth, but I, I think it's right to say the universities bear responsibility for this. They need to be advising people, well, it's the law is vague, so you can ignore it. No, the law may be vague, and that's a problem, but doesn't mean you can ignore it. Um, we should go chase research dollars everywhere. Oh, you know, the situation has changed. You're out of luck because I told you to chase research dollars, and I never told you any differently. So we do need better performance from academics. We also need better performance from policymakers. Um, I don't want to sound naive myself. But if you're going to stand up as a Republican or a Democrat, a liberal or a conservative, and say there are serious challenges from China in human rights, in the military realm, in the economic realm, and we need to face them as a national priority, you can't make speeches and decisions that are then aimed at winning the next election. You can't just simplify everything to that point. So uh, I wouldn't, you know, the micro side, the personal side that you're talking about, I can't address that directly because I don't know enough about the China Initiative. But I do know that better, more responsive and more effective U.S. policy uh, made by the Congress, made by the Biden administration and, the, and whoever follows them would make Americans feel much more secure about what's going on in our relationship with China, that we are prepared for aggression uh, by Xi Jinping and the Chinese Communist Party if it occurs. And that could have an effect on the human side. Um, I think right now we, a lot of people are very alarmed by different aspects of the U.S.-China relationship. Obviously, the main cause of that is China, but the second cause after that is poor U.S. policy and naive behavior by some uh, you know, U.S. leaders. And if we address those, I, I think some of the human problems would fade. And in that respect, I, I want to end uh, on a human note here um, before we let everyone go. Um, this is from Bloomberg Business Week, April 26th. Uh, 2021, and this particular article talked about the development, essentially, the, one of the key breakthroughs that allowed Moderna to make their vaccine. Um, this is straight from the piece. Nianshan Wang arrived in the U.S. from China about seven years ago to help explore an obscure niche in structural biology, manipulating coronavirus spike proteins to be more stable and thus better for use in vaccines. In early 2020, it was Wang who figured out how to make the spike protein on the novel coronavirus bind with human receptors, enabling Moderna to develop its COVID-19 vaccine in record time. I, I want to end on that note because it is an absolutely directly relevant uh, example of the kind of scientific collaboration that is made possible by those exchanges between the United States and China. And in this particular case, a scientific exchange that has undoubtedly saved tens of thousands, maybe hundreds of thousands of lives uh, in this country and elsewhere around the world. So while I definitely agree uh, with, with Jamil that we need to be on guard against <clears throat> what, the, what the PRC has been doing and undoubtedly will do, 
we don't want to repeat the mistakes that we made during the Cold War. And we certainly don't want to repeat the kind of mistakes that we have made uh, with respect to other researchers, such as Wen Ho Lee, um, who until the China Initiative came along, was undoubtedly, you know, the most prominent example of a U.S. government counterintelligence program really kind of run amok uh, and almost certainly on a racial basis. To my panelists, Derek Scissors, Jeremy Wu, Gisela Kusakawa, and my friend, I hope still, Jamil Jaffer, thanks so much uh, for being with us today. Thanks to you, uh, our audience, for participating. Um, I'm Patrick Eddington, Senior Fellow here at the Cato Institute. Thanks for watching.